As a player that has moved to Nashville and accomplished the pinnacle of the elements that someone may want to accomplish and have done so as a guitar player and a producer, kind of ran the the gamuts of the occupations that you can have as a musician in this town. If you were going to put a bumper sticker on your road case, what do you think it would say? Dig in and enjoy the ride. Dig yeah. in and enjoy the climb. That's that's better said because it it is a climb. And where did your journey begin when you got here? I came here in 1984 with a wife and baby at 21 years old. But I grew up playing country with my dad. Got me into playing banjo and fiddle, doing some bluegrass. You know, we were going to some of the contests and bluegrass festivals. And I was at his house one one afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, right before I was thinking about moving to L.A. And I saw Austin City Limits was on his TV. And Ricky Skaggs and his band were on there. And they were wearing the skinny ties and had the the, the 80s mullets and the whole, like they looked like the dudes that, I was identifying with it, uh-huh. when just the rock guys. Yeah. So right then and there, I made the choice to come up here, and we moved up here in November of 84. Didn't know anybody. The guys that helped me unload our truck, they were like, hey, man, there's this great band playing right down the street. It was Stagecoach Lounge, and it was Brent Mason and Hey Jacobs and Paul Franklin, those guys, playing with Don Kelly. And I sat right in front of Brent Mason for four hours listening to him play everything he knew. I realized real quick I was in deep water, you know, because I was thinking, holy crap, this is like the worst dive bar I've ever been in, and this this is like the best band I've ever heard playing country music. (laughs) Right? What's happening downtown in in the good bars, you know? Had no idea. All I knew to do was a guy had told me, hey, man, go join the union and fill out the little available notice. So I went down there, and it was like 200 bucks to join. And I was like, dang, man, that's a lot of that's a lot of dough. And they gave me that little card, you know, and I said, well, fill this out and put it on that bulletin board over there. So I, I wrote as much as I could on there. And I wrote every instrument I've ever touched, you know. I played everything and then drove away going, that's, you know, was pointless. And that afternoon, my phone rang, and it was a guy named Carson Chamberlain. He said that a guy named Keith Whitley was looking for a guitar player. He got my name off the union board, and what, did I want to come over and audition? I was like, yeah, I'll be over in the morning. So I went over. We played all day, man, in there. And it was Carson on steel and Bruce Rutherford on drums. A lot of the guys that wound up going with him all through his career, at the end of the day, Keith walked out in the parking lot with me and said, hey, man, I really love your playing. If you, you think you could learn the whole album by Friday because I'm doing a TV show called New Country. He was debuting his, his brand new album on RCA. It was his very first album. Wow. And I was like, yeah, I can learn the whole show by Friday. Harold Bradley's playing Tic Tac with us. Hoot Hester played fiddle. Chip Young played acoustic. Wow. And then it was Keith's band with those session guys sitting in with us. And, of course, those session guys were all big heroes of mine. And in the audience was Reba and Vince Gill, Steve Warner, Skaggs. It was all it was some of the cool people I really wanted to meet. So it was a huge opportunity for me. And I remember Vince Gill came up and said, who's the kid on guitar? It sounds great. You know, I overheard him say that to Keith. I'm standing over there wrapping my cables up, and I was like, this was cool because I didn't know who Whitley was. He was kind of like Chris Stapleton was when he was floating around town before he got his deal, and everybody knew how great he was, you know, and right. would show up, turn out, and see him. Because of his, the respect he'd already garnered, and he was such an incredible talent, we had, I, I got introduced to everybody. I kind of got exposed, and that really just opened so many doors, you know. There, mm-hmm. was, there was not another gig I could have stumbled into that would have done that for me at the, at that that moment in time you know from there man you know i was kind of plugged in people would hear me play and i did oak ridge boys a, a year i did kenny rogers a year i did dolly i did reba mcintyre for quite a few years because that, that was a that was kind of a premier gig at the time in the 90s that's kind of what i thought would be making it i didn't know anything about the session scene right. it, it didn't turn into a grind until about five years in with Reba, and and as great as Reba is, and it just kind of got to be the Groundhog's Day thing. I'd find myself standing up there on stage in front of a packed house, you know, daydreaming about being home 
I got to find something else to do, you know, right. to, to, to pay the bills. I just kind of started getting a bad attitude, started dealing with some depressing <laughs> moments, you know, right. boozing too much and just trying, you know, just feeling like, okay, what else, you know, because you kind of felt like I'd hit the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And the session world was daunting. You know, I was getting, I was getting a few calls, but like I wasn't home enough to, to follow up, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that was and that was frustrating. And the only reason I got any work on like some Stroud dates and things like that is because I could parrot those guys pretty good. So if one of those guys was down, you know, here I'd show up, you know. I remember Paul Franklin asked me one time, I showed up on a Stroud session and, and Mason Brent couldn't make it. He saw me and he goes, oh, man, is Brent sick? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man. <laughs> but uh, hey, good to see you. Glad to be yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. He didn't, Paul, you know, Paul, he's the sweetest guy in the world. He didn't yeah. mean, he's just generally concerned about his buddy, you know. Yeah. I was trying to kind of break into that, but I was doing demos at my house for some writers down there. And and some of them started sneaking out and like the, the, the song come out on the radio and like they ripped off our demo, you know. And, and, you know, people started going, man, you, you ought to start producing, you know. Uh -huh. I, I was like, I don't I don't know what I'm doing down here because I was doing it all. You know, I was mixing. I was doing it all. And we did, we made some pretty cool sounding stuff. In 1989, we I was playing guitar for Dolly. And I had just started that year with her when she put her band together. And, like, Dolly would just come out to sound check. And then she would kind of walk over to Gary Smith, her band leader, and and to Richard, her singer, and she kind of really didn't even talk to the rest of us at all, hardly. Sound checks were real short. She'd just basically come out and go, everything sound okay? All right, I'm out of here, and go back to her bus. I honestly didn't even know if she knew my name. Like, I, uh, you know, like three months into it, I'm like, hey, Dolly, you know. But So my hometown newspaper guy came out because I grew up not far from Dallas, and so – my mom was there. It was kind of a big, big homecoming, you know, see me play with Dolly. And so my hometown newspaper guy wanted to do a little story on me. So Dolly comes out there. She knew exactly what was going on, you know. So she came over and made the whole sound check about me, you know, embarrassed me. My face was so red all, all that whole time. She invites the guy onto her bus for an interview. In the interview, she said, you know, he's got a lot of music in him. He's probably going to wind up producing my records. You know, he's he's quiet, but he's deep. I'll never forget. Like, I still have that newspaper because my mom gave me like 10 copies of it. And I remembered her saying that. And at the time, I didn't even know what a producer was. Like 12 years later, she calls me to do that, you know, wow. to do that very thing. Just out of the blue, she goes, I hear you're a producer now. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm doing a little bit, you know. She said, well, you got a studio, don't you? I said, yeah, a, a little one. And she goes, I'm making a record out of here, and I'm over in Knoxville making a bluegrass record, and I'm stuck. And I want you to come over here and help me sort this out. I was scared to death. I didn't know what she had going. She didn't tell me any detail. I figure I'm going to drive over there and I'm going to walk into the room and there's going to be Jerry Douglas and Brian Sutton and all those guys and they're going to go, what are you doing here? And I pulled over twice and called my wife and said, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I'm not going to do this. I'm turning around. <laughs> and she was like, you get your butt on, over there, you know. Just go do it, you know. I was really freaked out about it. And, and we cobbled together that record called Halos and Horns. Rhea, have you ever been in a situation where it could have been pretty easy to sort of just go through the motions and do it because you didn't recognize maybe who was in the room, but then through just really doing your best, it led to, a, to an opportunity? There was a time in the early 90s and through the mid 90s where I was getting a little full of myself, you know, thinking, man, I'm I'm too good for this. I, there was nothing. It didn't seem like anything knew was happening in Nashville, you know, and all the records were sounding the same because it was literally the same guys playing on them and no fault of their own. But all the producers were cloning each other, you know. We, we didn't Because it, it, it was so industrious back then. There was so much money being made. And just feeling like, man, they're never going to want to hear anybody besides Dan Huff and Brent Mason. I mean, it literally 
they cast such a shadow. You can't even imagine. What I love about Nashville right now, like there's a bigger list of guys, Mm -hmm. you know. And I think a lot of that has to do the internet demystifying kind of what it's like in the studio. I never got to work with Brent. It was rare. Mm-hmm. Like the best thing that happened to me was when I started getting called to play some acoustic dates and I'd get to sit in there beside Dan Huff all day. I think now guys have an advantage because they can, you know, at 10 years old, you can look look around on the internet and see how it works. And we all have access to who, what gear everybody uses and how they're getting the sound. Mm-hmm. That really, I think, helps. So as a producer, when you, when you moved into that and, and deciding who to call, what do you think about when you're casting the band that you're looking for based on a based on a project? When I do the work tapes on an artist and I and I'm sizing it up, if it's a a budgeted record where I've got an opportunity to use different people for the over, across several sessions, then I will, and I'll 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 bundle the songs accordingly to try to play to their strengths. You know, especially in the drum chair and the electric chair. Like if I can't get the right electric player or drummer for a session, I'll, I'll change the date of the session. And then, you know, over the past few years, I've, I lean on Derek to, to help me, you know, man, who's, who's new out there? If I can't get my first three guys, you know, then I'll mm-hmm. be like, all right, who, who do you know? And because they are, they're the best judge of that, you know, right. the guys who sit in the chair beside them. They know who who cuts it and who doesn't. And yeah, they, for sure. they they ca- they know how to cast too. All those guys are producers too. So it, I'm always pleasantly surprised when the young guys walk in. That's what I love about being in Nashville right now. Being a producer, never been a better, easier time to make records around here because I'm very blessed. I still got the old guard guys that I lean on and and mm-hmm. so admire. There's exciting new guys that are that I don't even no you know that are right. roaming around doing great music and they come in and and there, there's no drop off like in my day if you had huff on a session one day and then you had me the next now yeah i could play fancy and i had the gear and i had the sounds but i didn't have the seasoning and the confidence i wasn't in that big room every day so you have that little that little twinge of do I belong here or am I under the microscope? What sort of things do you, would you suggest for someone to push themselves in environments that will help them build that personality? I never found a substitute for just the frequency of it. It's like Derek, Derek broke, when he broke through, found himself often in the room with guys who'd been doing it 40 years and, and played on hundreds of hits. That can only be intimidating. I don't care who you are. You know, I remember him telling me, you know, I feel, I remember the day when I finally felt like I belonged in there, you know. When you walk in the room and you know most of the people in there and you know, mm-hmm. you've played with them all week. Until you get there, it's not ever, I don't think, not a little nerve wracking. So it might be more about just accepting that that's where it's at as opposed to really focusing on how you can change it. One hundred percent. Patience. I remember talking to Dan Huff a lot about it and him saying when he came back from LA, he felt so ill at ease and I remember him telling me a story about a they were on a Clint Black session in Strat and and he had Brent and Dan told Dan, No, you play the solo. He wanted this real fast chicken picking thing. Mm-hmm. And Dan's like, Why? Well, there, you got the greatest chicken picker in town right, right here. You know, why are we doing this? You know, and Stroud just going, No, this is what I want, you know. Uh-huh. Him feeling like he said, I never wanted to crawl out of a room so bad as I did right <laughs> then. You know? I, I think no matter where you come from, it, it, it's 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 just a big mind screw, you know, trying to be as proficient at all of this as we do, especially now that we engineer ourselves and we you know, all the stuff that I never really wanted to learn. You know, I know so much more about that now than I ever wanted. Mm-hmm. to learn or thought I would because, you know, even going back 10 years, it was still very compartmentalized, you know. Now it's just an explosion of you got to do it all. And I, I, I get excited on the morning when I come in early and I'm going to do some guitars, you know. But then it's also just mind-numbing sometimes because you can't, you get into the Eric Johnson syndrome where you can't sign off, you can't stop playing the solo over and over, you know, and, <laughs> It's just it's that whole thing because you need somebody to say, oh, it's great. You know, don't change it. You need a producer, you know. 
I would say to anybody trying to get into this scene, whether you're trying to just break into playing live, choose your gig wisely. You might be on the biggest tour in the world, but you might still be not getting the visibility you would if you were playing at Rudy's every Tuesday night. You know, if you want to break into the inside scene and be like on records. Yeah, that's a great reminder because I think going into it, there can be a perception of, you know, get the stadium tour and tour the world and do all that, which is awesome and a great experience. But I think also recognizing, is that what you want your career to be? And if it is, then 100% stay in that world. But you had a really good point about recognizing after doing that for years and really enjoying it and having a great time, it was no longer the fulfillment that, yeah. that, that it, you know, that it was before. And if we don't recognize that, then we fall into unhealthy habits, mindset, you know, no, losing the, yeah. the love and the passion for it. But if we do stay aware of that and we notice it when something isn't feeling like this isn't doing what it used to do for me, being open to, to changing and figuring out what it is that is going to fill you up. The only disappointment that I've ever experienced in Nashville, because Nashville's been wonderful to me and, and my whole family, when I had kind of hit the pinnacle of the, the stadium tours, you know, I was playing with the biggest artist in Nashville at the time. and But I realized my musicianship wasn't progressing like I wanted, like like it could have if I'd have stayed in town and been more challenged every day instead of out on the road figuring out what fabulous place we're going to go eat lunch and then get up and rock out 20,000 people, you know, yeehaw, but you're playing the same songs. And, you know, yeah, you've got that dial and you got the tones down and you're up there entertaining, which is important and fun too. I, I recommend everybody do the road. You know, I mean, that's where you, that's where you, that's where it's at, playing the songs for your people. But, but as a, but as a guitarist, you know, as a craftsman on the instrument, a student of music, you know, you, I, I think the best trajectory, I would advise somebody come here and make it here first, you know, like, like infiltrate the town, play on Broadway, do all that stuff. Man, there's some fabulous musicians down there. Make friends with songwriters who need to cut songs, you know, and, and hook or crook, get in there and start playing on their records. That's how Derek got started. Because your musicianship, it's going to be challenging every day, but your musicianship is going to expand so much more than if you lock into some real good pay-in opportunity that's that's real shiny and glossy, but but not as challenging. Mm -hmm. I've gr I grew more as a player from 2000 to the, to now than I would than I did all those years before because I I'm I get challenged every day mm -hmm. uh, every demo I play on or produce every song I produce every singer that I get to produce or gu guitar player I produce or track I'm forced to play on yeah I, you know every it, it's more challenging right. I'm a better musician for it mm -hmm. I would not be the same musician if I was still out there on the road because you get complacent you know. Have there ever been any moments that you've recognized maybe a shift in, in someone that would maybe lead you to call them a little bit less? You know, maybe I need to start looking for somebody else for this chair. I just, I have noticed sometimes some of us older guys can fall behind the power curve. Like I'm one of them. Like, like I'm a, humbly I say, I'm a really good electric guitar player, but I'm not up to the speed where I would want to go in and do a five song bang out. I mean, I, I could do it, but I couldn't do it to the level of my son or Jerry McPherson right now. I'm just not doing it every day. It, it's, 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 it's being out of shape. There's a million little details that when you're doing it every day, you're, you're way up on that curve. Now, leave me alone in the studio there with my guitar and I'll play you something fabulous and you'll come in and It'll be it'll be right, but mm -hmm. it's but I have I need that time. I need to slow it down. You know, we go through phases where there's trends, and if it becomes obvious that he's not up on this trend, say there's a keyboard guy, and there's a certain, you know, when all the buzzy synth sounds started showing up, and, and you know, and the and the delay gags with, you know, there was a certain sect of piano players that I was disappointed that they didn't. But that's not their deal. It's not where their head's at, you know. They don't want to sit around and figure out how to do what Dave Cohen and Dave Dorn do. You know, that was a moment where I made some shifts in who I would call. You know, you got to listen to country radio. <laughs> you got to drive in listening to the highway, whether you, whether you want to or not. You know, I mean, you can't be listening to Mahavishnu Orchestra. I'm studying jazz right now every morning online, but but you 
because that's what I do for fun, and that challenges me as a player. But I have to listen to the highway. You know, I have to listen to all the new stuff that comes out, and, and I don't enjoy that at all. You know, rarely do I hear anything that rocks my socks. But because when a young artist walks into my door, if I don't know what they're listening to, if they they start dropping those names and I don't even know who they are, it kind of makes me a bad choice for a producer. So, you know, you really have to keep your, your head fresh and, and not just always keep your head looking back at the stuff that you thought was cool. Dolly's latest record has is so cool, and I've been hearing so much about it. Can you tell me a bit about how yeah. what your role was in it? And- yeah, man. You know, I've done a lot of country records for her and some bluegrass records, gospel records, patriotic records. And when she got inducted into the Hall of Fame, she go, oh, Lord, I'm not, I turned them down. I'm not going to do that. Well, then they did. They voted her in anyway. She said, I want you to produce a rock record for me. It floored me because I was like, I really didn't think I'd be in the running to do that. I said, well, what, what are you thinking on this record? And she goes, well, her husband's a big rock and roll fan, so she wanted to do a bunch of songs that he liked. I took an evening, and I just started throwing down grooves on my guitar, like ideas, and doing what I call a la-la track, where I kind of la-la a melody, like, nah, 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 you know, mm-hmm. just kind of outline in a vertical melody or whatever for her. So I did like 15 ideas. And I put, I had my guy put them on a CD because she's old school. She still has me bring CDs. So I had my guys take it over there the next morning to her house. And, oh, I really like some of these. These are good, you know. I thought, okay, cool. You know, m- might get a co-writer too out of this, you know. And, but, and we'd already kind of talked about what artists in that initial meeting. She goes, oh, I really like Sting, you know. And I, of course, I love the Beatles, you know, and all this. So I'm kind of making notes. And a lot of that, initially just intuitively came together. I was thinking, all right, yeah, it would be cool. Stevie Nicks would be great, you know. And we didn't have anybody committed. I mean, she had a lot of people telling her, oh, I want to sing with you, mm-hmm. but like, but but getting them to do it, like getting right. back through their label and their managers. And yeah, that's a whole. That's a, that can be a whole nother deal. And after about the first three or four months and the word was starting to get out, we started having rock stars call us. Elton John called me one day. I was out in my car listening to a mix. <laughs> I can't tell Elton. I'm like, Elton John? <laughs> he goes, yes. I went, holy shit. He's like, holy shit. Yeah, that's me. He said, I hear you're re- making a record, you know. So a lot, there was a lot of magic stuff like that. And then there was a lot of chasing people down like Steven Tyler. That dude is hard to pin down. Like I got an initial... Oh, yeah, anything for Dolly. And like a year later, it took Mick Fleetwood was over at Don Mick's studio and putting some percussion down on a song for me. And he texted Stephen. Like two days later, Stephen called me, said, all right, I'm ready to do this, you know. So what was that process like recording with everyone? I know some of the people came to town. Yeah, it was then, a mix. Some of them yeah. phoned it in. Sure. One of the coolest things ever, and I think all the session guys will agree with that, is when John Fogarty came in. And I had Dolly's mic here and his mic here. Big old band on the floor because we cut his old song. We cut the old Credence song, uh, As Long As I Can See the Light. Well, we went out to the piano booth, and we were doing this kind of legato part, the beginning, Rojas on piano. They get in there on the mics, and, man, the hair on everybody's arms stood up. And most of what we did, I think we did one take that was that. It was truly was a live recording. And then 80% of what you hear on the album is what they sang in the booth. You can hear the drum bleed on the lead tracks. Like, they were in the room with us, and that was really cool because that's kind of a lost art, you know. So when we started this, you said that your bumper sticker would be? Enjoy the climb. Embrace the climb. That, right. I, let me refine it. Embrace the climb. You know, embrace, embrace the process because right. it is a process, man. I, I don't know anybody in this business that pauses to look back. You don't see a lot of guys resting on their laurels because mm-hmm. it is a pursuit. Mm-hmm. You struggle so hard. You're swimming so hard when you're first starting out. I'm enjoying it more now than I ever did. I work with a lot of unsigned artists, you know, that come into my studio and they're they're always looking for the magic pathway or the shortcuts, and there just ain't any. It's get in line and suffer, <laughs> bleed on it, uh-huh. get frustrated, get your butt kicked, 
that's the part you have to embrace. You know, you have to embrace the scary parts, the slow parts, the times when phone ain't ringing, the times when you feel lo- the loneliness of the pursuit of it. And it's not a team sport, you know, trying to be an artist. You know, it's very lonely. You don't get a lot of help. You're going to get burned out. You're going to get pushed out. You're going to get, you know, ignored. You got to find your peace in it, you know, and, and enjoy that. Enjoy that mountain climb, man. Well, thanks for sharing your journey with me. Yes, this sir. is incredible, man. I, I appreciate, appreciate it. you taking time to put me on here, man.